Mr. Yeah, if that's all right. Absolutely. Pre please proceed. Uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Chair, and thank you, Minister. I, I, I want to go back to a couple of different topics. I have three sort of main areas of focus in this line, uh, round of questions. Um, the first deals with uh, under operating expense uh, line eight in the budget on page uh, 208. And you answered some of these questions already. It's the increase from 960,000 to 6.4 million for climate leadership plan. And you mentioned that that's the Labor Department's support for the coal transition communities. And I, I guess you know it's a very significant increase in expenditures 567,000 567 percent rather um, and it's uh, and and I guess what I'm wondering about is you know you talked about some I think laudable goals with regard to retraining on assistance with relocation that sort of thing but I, I'm curious to know first of all what is the overall labor part of the coal transition strategy is that something that's publicly available uh, do we have have specific targets? Are there measurables? Do we know how many, uh, you know, coal workers we're targeting or hoping to be able to assist with these funds? Or is it, as I more suspect it is, and as our former Premier used to say, Dave Hancock, it's the NDP's strategy of just add money and stir? So, thank you for that question. Um, we know through coordination with both uh, our colleagues in the Department of Energy, the companies involved, uh, like TransAlta and others, um, generally the expected timelines uh, for mm -hmm. what is going right. to be happening with these workers. Right. Uh, and it's based on uh, th that informed knowledge okay. um, that we have created uh, this coal workforce transition program to provide supports. Now, I will say um, it, it's early days for this program, but we're seeing a lower uptake than we expected. Okay. And so this may be um, something we need to continue to monitor. My mm -hmm. first concern when I saw the lower uptake was that workers weren't aware mm -hmm. of the program. Um, but after digging into it, it's, it's clear workers are finding other opportunities and are not needing the program, which okay. I think is a positive outcome. Uh, has that addressed your question? Yeah, no, uh, it, well, like, exactly. Like, and, and I understand that you're working in a little bit of a void. Uh, we, we've never had a radical policy change that's thrown hundreds of workers out of, out, out of work before. And so this is sort of uncharted territory. Um, I'm going to move on to section 2.8, line 2.8 on uh, on page 208, and that's uh, the fairly dramatic increase in the skills and training support budget. It's uh, it's 34 percent higher than last year's budget. It's an 11.6 percent increase over last year's forecast for the actuals, um, and and. You know, uh, fundamentally, having additional funding for workforce training I is great, uh, and I agree with it. But then when I page to page 111 of your business plan under performance measures, and I look at 3.A, uh, sort of the top of the page, that one of the performance measures is percentage of training for work clients reporting that they are either employed or in further education or training after leaving a skills training program. And the last actual for 2016 is 62%. And the targets for the three years going out are at only 70 percent. Uh, I guess, first of all, I, I would consider 62 percent to be a really poor result. And I'm just wondering what's being done to try to improve that. Obviously, you are trying to improve that because you've set a target that is marginally higher, but, but is only at 70 percent for the next three years going out. So I wonder if you comment both on the relatively poor <laughs> performance or the, the, the poor actual number and, and why the targets aren't higher. Thank you for those questions. I'll, I'll likely ask my deputy minister to, to weigh in on this. But uh, a lot of the training for work um, programs were brought over from community and social services. Uh, and so over the past two years, with the realignment of programs, um, how, that, how that money is being allocated, the types of programs that we are funding uh, has been has been evolving as contracts uh, expire and new contracts are awarded to provide service to unemployed Albertans. Um, essentially, 70% um, of the Albertans accessing these programs were recently unemployed, uh, and we are working to improve the skills and training uh, within the sure. labour climate that we have, sure. which which does have higher unemployment at the time at the moment. And I'll ask my deputy minister what he would like to add to that. Um, I, so, uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, a couple of things. Um, so with the transfer of the programs over to Labour, 
we started targeting a different population group. So initially what we received was essentially they were targeting people who, um, you know, they weren't necessarily people who were, you know, closest, uh, who, who had recently been unemployed, if I can characterize it that way. And so we're specifically targeting people who are eligible for employment insurance or, you know, have been in the last five years right. uh, laid off. So trying to get those people back into the labor force so they don't end up on the employment and of course. income support yep. rules. No, that's right. So it reflects a bit of a shift uh, because initially it was more globally delivered. And so we've been targeting our results. And so I think that explains a bit of the 62%. As the minister said, the rest of it um, has a lot to do with just the health of the economy. So when Alberta's economy is really hot, then you know people will get trained and find employment fairly quickly. And so part of it reflects just the state of the labor market at, at this particular time. Um, so you know I think when we get to when we hit our 70 percent, we'll certainly look at adjusting these things going forward. But you know we um, you know we just have to re recognize that we don't directly control whether they get employed or not. No, Train no, them for those jobs. no, you're right. You're preparing them for the eventuality and, and you know, hopefully give them the skills that they need and hopefully that results in them getting gainful employment. So I, I'm, I share your uh, hope that we hit a lot higher than 70% going forward and I understand some of the restrictions going forward. I want to page to another area of the budget that probably doesn't get a whole lot of attention and that's in, uh, in the fiscal plan document on page 119 in a section section that is entitled um, Economic Outlook. Um, now this is sort of the boring stuff that nerdy economists look at, but uh, um, I'm, I'm looking at the tables on 119 and I'm wondering why the forecasts, especially in the two out years for both employment and unemployment are so optimistic. In, in my view, overly optimistic. And, 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 you know, to give you an example, in the employment benchmark, uh, in the first two years, the government of Alberta uh, forecast is sort of, you know, it's, it's close to the high end of the range and certainly above the average. Uh, same thing for the second year, for 2019. And then in the third and fourth years, granted there are fewer forecasts to draw on, the banks all quit forecasting that far out, but um, our, our government of Alberta forecast is the same as the highest forecast for that metric. And then when we drop to the bottom of the page to unemployment rate benchmarks, Again, in the first two years, I think that the government's exercising some prudence in terms of choosing a number that is sort of somewhere close to the average, uh, although in 2019 a little lower than the average. But then all of a sudden in 2020 and 2021, uh, wow, we get real optimistic. In fact, uh, our, our projection is at or even much lower than the lowest projection for unemployment come 2021. Now, don't get me wrong. I hope we hit those marks. I hope we exceed all of those marks. Uh, don't, don't ever say that I'm cheering against Alberta because I'm not. I guess my question is, first of all, uh, are those uh, are those uh, optimistic estimates or optimistic forecasts going into the out years, are they realistic? Uh, do you have data that supports why you're being so optimistic? And, and, and what is the impact on the budget if we don't meet those benchmarks? I guess that's my bigger concern because I, I really think that the out years of this budget are built on a lot of assumptions that are extremely optimistic. Like just everything has to happen perfectly, a perfect storm of a lot of things happening that right now are very much still in doubt. And when I look at the drill down deeper and see the, these, these pieces of data that indicate not only in things like getting a pipeline built and getting uh, product flowing and, and higher oil prices and lower differentials and all the other things that would have to happen to reach balance, we also have very optimistic forecasts for both employment growth and reductions in unemployment. So my question is, what's the basis for these optimistic uh, forecasts and what impact will it have if we don't meet the benchmarks? So thank you for that. Um, I'm afraid I actually don't have that page because I brought only labor stuff with me. There you go. Um, but what I can uh, surmise is that when it comes to unemployment information, when it comes to labor market, uh, the work that our ministry does informs a lot of what government has. Uh, and as an example, we've recently created our occupational demand and supply outlook forecasts um, that actually forecast a labor shortage of 50,000 workers in the next 10 years. It's a real good report. It's and, very helpful. Thank you. And identifies kind of the areas where that would be. So I would imagine uh, that the labor market information that uh, 
we produced in this ministry was part of that forecasting process. Okay. Uh, looking forward to, to what may be needed. What will the impact be if we don't hit the targets, though, I guess is my question. So if, uh, when we see increasing unemployment, um, the needs for the skills and training services we provide. I hesitate to interrupt, but the time for other parties has concluded. Uh,